Hey guys, it's Dr. Delvina, Brain Love. Ask me about brain. So I posted and said, depression feels like dot, dot, dot. And people commented, a lot of people had some, everyone had good commentary about what depression feels like. And I really just wanted to do a video to talk about depression because it affects people in different ways. But commonly, what you see often in many people, whether it's men or women, there's always themes of negativity, feeling like you're in a black place in your life, feeling like people don't care about you, that's that negativity again, and also feeling like you have to wait it out. That's not true though. You don't have to wait out depression. There are things you can do to try to prevent depression. There's things you can do to treat your depression and there's things you can do so that you don't stay depressed as long. So let's talk about the word depression first. Depression is a term that's used very commonly. Um, someone might have a bad day or something happens and they say, I feel depressed. So here's the thing. Depression is actually a clinical term. It's a diagnosis. However, it's a very um, generic term, right? Because there's different types of depression and there's different ways to diagnose it. The most severe form of depression is called major depressive disorder. And then there's also something called bipolar affective disorder. So really briefly, let's talk about the two. Major depressive disorder, that's the most severe form of depression that someone can experience. And even within major depressive disorder, there's different uh, qualifiers. It could be mild, moderate, or severe. I'm just trying to break it down for you so you understand that there's really different types. So what qualifies as a major depressive episode? If someone has symptoms, certain symptoms consistently for two weeks or more, they may qualify for a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. What do we mean by symptoms? So there's a feeling of sadness, also, for you to, to meet the criteria to be diagnosed as majorly depressed, you have to have a loss, of in, a loss of interest in doing certain things, hobbies, whatever it may be, things that you typically do, and or you have to feel suicidal or have thoughts about suicide, along with a few other symptoms or behaviors. If you have at least five of those things for two weeks or more, then you qualify for a diagnosis of major depression or major depressive disorder. Sometimes people are so sad or intensely depressed that they also lose touch with reality or become psychotic. What we see with that is that they might be paranoid, like thinking people are poisoning their food, or they might hear voices that don't really exist, which we call hallucinations or see things that don't exist. Now, with major depressive disorder, it can be treated, but if you don't do anything to treat it, meaning you don't take medications, go to psychotherapy, um, or some other interventions that I'll talk about later, then your episode could last a long time, um, as long as up to a year. When that happens, you are um, people are sad and distraught and it, it increases your risk of worsening your symptoms, like becoming more suicidal or even considering a plan to kill yourself. So that's why it's important that people seek treatment when they are experiencing some of those symptoms. Some of the other symptoms could include changes in appetite, changes in, in your sleep habits, like sleeping more, sleeping less, eating more, eating less, poor concentration, being distractible, um, also loss of um, interest in sex, decreased libido. Men get angry when they feel depressed. It may not be a sadness. They may describe it as more so um, of being angry. So there's a lot of different things that we see, but I would say if you notice it's the change of your functioning or your behaviors, along with loss of interest in things, being sad, sometimes feeling suicidal, then definitely you have to see someone to see if there's something you can do about it instead of just waiting for it to go away. There are other types of depression as well. There's something called seasonal affective disorder. That's when the weather um, influences someone's mood or how they feel. It's the same sort of similar symptoms that I just described in major depressive disorder, except it's sort of on a uh, lesser scale. It may not be as intense and it lasts for a longer amount of time. And typically there's no suicidal ideations associated with that. Seasonal affective disorder is influenced by the weather, by sunshine or sunlight or lack of. Um, we see in places where it gets dark early or it's darker for a longer amount of time, places like Alaska and Seattle, 
up north, you know, I'm from Maryland. In Maryland, sometimes when the winter time comes, people can experience bouts of depression that don't meet criteria for major depressive disorder, which I just explained. But because it happens under the influence of lack of sunlight, the cold weather, grayness, then we call it seasonal affective disorder. There's also something called dysthymia. That is like a persist, persistent depressive mood that lasts for several months. Um, it does not reach the intensity or the level of being a major depressive episode like what I was describing a few moments ago. And that person may not have the same quantity of symptoms, meaning you may not have the loss of interest, the suicidal thinking, the sadness, the changes in sleep, the changes in appetite, the distractibility, the low energy, things like that. You may only have a few of those things on several days, several weeks, some months, and then that may qualify you as having what used to be called dysthymia, but now was called uh, persistent depressive disorder. So there's several different types as you can hear. So saying I'm depressed or saying that you were diagnosed with depression, it really doesn't say a lot of things specifically. It is a, a, um, a medical term, a clinical term, but there's different types. So I just wanted you guys to know that, that there are different types of depressive disorder so that you kind of know what you're working with or you can help your family member. Now, how can we describe ourselves when we're not feeling well or when our, our mood dips low? I tell people to say things like, hmm, you know, I feel sad today or I'm having a sad moment or I have melancholy or I feel blue. Those are great descriptions to state how one feels when their mood is low or dips low. Um, it can have a genetic linkage. Um, if there's something called nature and nurture, how we raise our children, it really has, um, it really influences how they deal with stress and how they cope with things. If they're raised in a household where they see that mom, when um, there's a lot of stress, she goes in her room, she stays in the bed for several days at a time, closes the door, doesn't interact, doesn't cook, doesn't clean, or if dad is doing that, he just doesn't go to work, that can influence the way your children, how they cope when they're older. So this nature nurture thing, you can be born with uh, um, certain things too genetically because of what has happened in the family or what your mom or father or grandparents may have in their uh, genetics as well in their DNA. Things like anxiety can be inherited or uh, increase the risk of someone else developing an anxiety disorder because of grandparents, great grandparents, them also uh, suffering or are enduring the same types of ailments. But again, I think also you cannot deny that what happens in our households also has an influence on what manifests in your children. So seeing how you cope or how your parents coped and how they dealt with certain things, that influences what you'll be like as an adult and how you'll deal with stress. Um, so there's that genetic um, predisposition for some people. Um, of course, there's also milder forms of depression. Um, clinically, I'm, I'm using that term, right? So sometimes people have situational depression or something we call, a, call adjustment disorder with depressive symptoms. That occurs when someone, there's something going on in their life, whether um, they lost a job, they're going through relationship problems, um, something happened or changed in their life that has caused them to have consistent sadness or melancholy or to feel blue. And maybe they notice a couple of changes too in their behaviors. Um, they might have changes in sleep and appetite, that sort of thing. So that's an adjustment disorder with depression. I'm not saying that everything needs to be labeled, that you need to diagnose these things. Really the bottom line here is that we can do things to try to control or prevent. Sometimes we can't. So someone who has, um, certain things occurring in their DNA or in their genetics that predisposes them to experience episodes of major depression because there are people, and I promise you, this is based on what I've seen in clinical practice in my office, in the prison, in the military, there are some people who have things in place. Their life is balanced. They don't have financial issues or woes. They have good support. They come from a family that, um, has taught them certain things in life, how to cope and um, you know, situations such as that. They don't have a stressor that's causing them to feel sad, but they still experience episodes of major depression. So don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we can prevent all mental illness, but if we try and if we work at it, we can be proactive about certain things. Um, what does it mean to try to prevent 
mental illness or prevent things like anxiety or depression? Well, number one is living a healthy, balanced life as long as you can, as much as you can. That includes exercising on a regular basis because we know exercise is important for a natural increase of our endorphins, right? These chemicals that help us to feel good and balance our mood like dopamine, norepinephrine, serotonin, exercise will get you that. Exercise helps the brain, not just the muscles and the body and the heart, it helps the brain too. Eating healthy, nutrition. On my YouTube, I have a video on there. I have two videos actually that talks about healthy diet and nutrition, brain love foods. So there's a certain type of tomato that people can eat and because of it contains lycopene in the skin that can help with mood but also just not eating a lot of fatty foods not eating fried foods not eating a lot of meat beef and things like that which are hard on the gi tract i bet you didn't know you have a brain in your gut that brain in your gut means that we have um, areas in our in our gut and our stomach that create feel good chemicals like the ones that your brain is trying to create to help balance your mood and prevent anxiety those things take place in your gut also so listen if you're not eating healthy if you're putting all this sluggish stuff in there things that's going to cause and create slug like fat grease a lot of cholesterol so that's your fatty foods and your uh fast food it can slow down the process of what's going on in your stomach and your gut so that's why we got to eat healthy Things like blueberries, asparagus, broccoli, um, sweet potatoes. Now, fish contains a lot of omega-3. I am no longer eating flesh, happy to say, for about a week now. However, you can also acquire those things from other stuff in your diet, okay? So, exercise, eating healthy. Also, teaching your children at a young age how to cope with stress. You ever seen a kid who's playing a video game and they get mad because they lost and they just, ah! They haul and they throw it across the room. You wanna teach them. This is just a game. No need to get angry or excited. Practice and play again and you'll do better. It seems like something minor, but actually it has a lot to do with how they'll deal with stress later in life. If you see your children in the home, they have a disagreement and they're all arguing and using profanity and being mean to one another, you want to teach them. You can have a disagreement without having a full-fledged argument. We don't have to go all out and like, you know, um, uh, knuckle up and get so angry that we're no longer talking, using our regular voices and having a dialogue. It should be about an exchange of ideas and understanding that sometimes we'll have disagreements. So learning how to cope. So we said already, a good diet. Oh, and I didn't mention drinking plenty of water in that diet. You gotta hydrate. The brain needs water. The brain functions off of water. Most of your brain is composed of water. So we need to have a nutritious diet, drink plenty of water. We need to exercise on a daily basis. We have to create uh, or learn coping skills, teach our children coping skills at a young age and show them through our own actions how to cope with stressful events or activity. You gotta do those things. Communication is another way to try to prevent, resolve, stress, depression, anxiety. Just talking and dialoguing with people and having an exchange of ideas. Having a good circle of support. So when you do have those days when your mood seems to dip a little low, you wanna be able to talk to people. Now, in the beginning, I did mention that severe types of depression can be associated with a disorder called major depression. I also mentioned bipolar. I'm not going into bipolar during this segment, but just know that people who have bipolar can experience episodes of major depression. I hope that this helps a little bit as far as treatment goes. I think everyone deserves, they owe it to themselves to speak to a mental health professional. You should have someone who you can go to. So if you're having stressful periods in your life, you can call that person and say, hey, I wanna come in for a few sessions so I can bounce some things off of you so I can process some things in my life right now. So going to a mental health professional, especially if you're experiencing one of those severe forms of depression that I talked about, psychotherapy is very effective. What is psychotherapy? It's going to talk to someone, a professional, a professional, a trained professional, sitting with them and talking to them about some of the stressors or all of the stressors in your life, the things that um, have caused you some sadness or to feel unnerved, 
and allowing them to help you, right? Because you have to be a part of it. You're not going in there for them to then say to you, here, this is what you have to do. It can feel like work and that's okay. Good psychotherapy should feel like you're working because change requires work. There's different types of psychotherapy modalities like cognitive behavioral therapy, the, there's something called supportive therapy. Sometimes when people experience a loss, like someone dying, um, a loved one dying or passing, they may just need some supportive psychotherapy. Um, there's also therapy for like grieving and bereavement that I just that I just mentioned. So there's different types of psychotherapy modalities. Psychotherapy can done with someone like myself, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, social worker, a mental health counselor, someone who's a licensed mental health professional. There's also use of medications. Um, sometimes people have to use an antidepressant. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just like any other part of your body. If your heart's not functioning well to control your blood pressure, the sugar in your blood, you may need to take medication. The same is true for the brain. Sometimes the brain just loses the ability to, to maintain its functioning, meaning to crank out or make those chemicals that keep your brain balanced or keep you from feeling sad consistently. Sometimes it's not that you don't have the chemicals. It could be that the place in your brain, the receptors we call them, where those chemicals are going, maybe they're not functioning the way that they should be. Maybe you're under so much stress that your brain is not able to function and do everything it's supposed to the way it usually does. So that's why medication can help. What happens if you don't treat severe depression or a depressive episode and you just allow it to get better on its own? It'll get better on its own, but it can last for a very long time. And during that period, you're enduring such darkness and frustration and feeling lonely and just the negative thinking that it hurts. And when people are uh, experiencing these depressive episodes, other things can happen to you physically, like your blood pressure can go up, your blood sugar can increase, you gain weight sometimes, sometimes people lose a lot of weight, it interrupts your sleeping, so you're not functioning the way that you need to at work. So treatment is imperative, especially when you're experiencing depression to a level that it's interrupting your life or has become socially dysfunctional for you, interfering with your personal relationships, with how you function at work, any of those things. So psychotherapy, medication, I already talked about prevention with exercise and, and diet, but during the episodes too, of course, continue to exercise, get outside, get fresh air, sunlight really helps with that. Learn what makes you happy. For some people, seeing water, the ocean, going to the beach makes them happy. Making you happy could also mean eating certain things, but we don't want to eat for comfort because when you overeat for comfort to make yourself feel better and that's not sustained, you're not getting better. Sometimes people get into the cycle of just continuously overeating and then they gain a lot of weight. So you want to avoid that. You want to do something healthy that makes you happy. Now, there's alternative things too, like yoga, meditation, Tai Chi, prayer, the spirituality, CBD, which we're starting to sell in our office in our medical spa. Some places also or some articles suggest that marijuana can help with depression. I have to discuss that in another video because it'll take too long. We're already at 18 minutes. So just know there's a lot of things you can do to prevent, to treat, and to maintain if you have any questions, please DM me or feel free to call my office at 305-981-1700 and check out my YouTube page. There's some information there too that you could use so that you can maintain, prevent, and also treat. Thank you for listening. Brain love.